Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back. I hope that you had a, a great day, a great Sunday. Um, I have to be honest with you. I have always wondered what it would be like to preach two sermons in a row. I know a lot of pastors do that. They'll preach multiple services, especially on Sunday morning, and I've never had to do that. I've preached a message on a Sunday morning, went home and took a nap, and then came back and did the evening service. But in recording this, literally just a few moments ago, I finished with the morning service, and so here it is in the evening service. So I, I guess I'm in the big leagues now, huh? But anyway, I hope that you're doing well. Um, it, it's a brand new year, and typically the first Sunday of a new year, I preach from Hebrews chapter 12. Now, of course, I wasn't here the first two Sundays of the new year, so I want to take this evening service and I want us to look at Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. This morning we talked about walking by faith, not by sight. And folks, if we're going to do that, I think Hebrews 12 is one of those passages that just encourages us to get into what God wants us to do and to trust Him and to keep carrying on even when it feels difficult. Church, you probably have learned this in, in the nearly, you know, ever how many years I've been here now. I'm on... Has it been almost three years, two and a half? Um, it, there's three passages in the Word of God that are just passages that have shaped my life forever. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27 being one of those. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. And another one is the passage we're going to be looking at this evening, Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. You, you're familiar with this because I have preached it several times here. But folks, we need to be reminded because we're in perilous times. We're still in a pandemic. There, there's still just things going around that trouble us in, in, our, in our world at large. But that does not give us an excuse to not be all that God wants us to be. So Hebrews 12 this is one of my favorite passages, and I'm so excited. Again, church, we love you. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you for those that are watching from home. We hope that you're safe and that you are well. Let me open with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right into Hebrews 12. Father, we love you. Lord, we just thank you for this church. Lord, I thank you for the lives that have been touched. Lord, I thank you for the lives that are being touched. And Lord, we just pray that we stay in the center of your will, Lord, as we serve. Lord, as we move to this passage tonight, Lord, it's one of those passages that, that, that is so powerful and encouraging us. Lord, that is, that is my prayer tonight, that if someone here is just weary, Lord, maybe physically, maybe spiritually, emotionally, that, Lord, we'll just be charged to be all that you want us to be. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 1. Now, let's remember the, the context of this passage. Um, Jews were becoming Christians. They were giving their lives to Christ. And they were being persecuted for it. I mean, think about it. They had left the temple and they had embraced Christianity. And, and there was a lot of, of persecution from their family from, from other citizens, neighbors, and, and for a lot of these new Christians, it meant losing everything. I mean, to become a Christian, you might lose your family, you might lose your livelihood, you, you were literally put out on the street. And, and so you can imagine such a sacrifice. A lot of these new Christians, they were Christian, but they were scared. And, and they were wondering, man, if God is really pleased with me, I mean, I am struggling here. Am I doing something wrong? Is it normal to be persecuted like this? And, and so the writer of Hebrews is writing to encourage them that you're okay, that God is going to give you what you need. You just got to press forward. Man, isn't that a word for us tonight? Regardless of how the first 16 days of this new year, new year is going for, for each of us, we have got to get back to the basis of I'm going to push forward and serve the Lord. So let's get into this text. Now, I want to read verse 1, but we're going to look at the, toward the, the last phrase first because really uh, it is the heart of, of what is being said. And I don't know if y'all can hear, I hope the weather is better on Sunday than it is on Saturday because it sounds like it is raining cats and dogs. So I'm hoping you're able to hear me okay, but it is storming here right now. But let's dive into the Word of God. Beginning in verse 1, we are reminded, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now here is the heart of what we've got to do. Here is how we must run. There, there, there's no debate about it. The, the, the author here reminds us, let us run with endurance. I mean, that is what we're admonished to do. I said it in the sermon this morning that Christianity, we're always to be moving forward. Every day we ought to read the Word of God and be impacted by it. We're not just reading it. And by the way, this is a brand new year. Do you, do you have your Bible reading plan started? Folks, that is our power. If you want God to work in and through your lives, there, there's, there's two things, really three things that have got to happen. You have got to be a person of prayer. You have got to be a person that falls in love and devours the Word of God. And we've got to be people that do not forsake the assembling together. And I know we're in a pandemic, and it's not safe for everyone to be here. Praise the Lord, we have this technology, and we have our audio crew where you can watch the, this at home. But really, folks, if we're going to run with endurance, we've got to stay in the Word of God, we've got to stay on our knees in prayer, and we've got to have the encouragement of other believers. And, and so we're always to be moving forward every day, growing, as I say, a little closer to the Lord, falling in love with Jesus a little more, learning more about the talents that God has given us and how we can use them. You know what is the greatest thing is in our human minds, we're like, man, I've got all this stuff i got to do in life, right? Who had not got stuff to do? That's one of the things I enjoyed about being on vacation for, 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 the, two, for the 10 days. Um, you know is we didn't really have an agenda. There wasn't anything scheduled. So for most of us, even if you're retired, you know, my, my parents like to joke that they're busier now than they ever did when they worked. So we got all this stuff we got to do. But you know what really gives us joy as believers? Now here it is. God created us to work. He created us to be productive. And I know there's stages of life where we can't do what we once did, but, but you've heard me say it, if God has left us here, he's left us here for a purpose, and there's still something you can do. I'm going to tell you one of the greatest joys in my life. The greatest joys in my life is when a believer finds out what God wants them to do, and they're excited about doing it. That's what the, the writer is saying here. I almost said the Apostle Paul. Maybe he wrote this. We're not sure. But, but whatever apostle it was, run with endurance. And, and, and it excites me, especially senior adults. You know, they'll reminisce about, I used to teach Sunday school. I used to be a deacon. I, I'm not really able to do those things. But then they find what God wants them to do now. And there's just a joy that overflows out of them. Folks, we were created to be productive. We were created to worship God and to share our faith. We were created, yes, to serve on committees and to be active in a church. And, and, and I tell you, humanly, we're like, no, I got all this stuff to do. I don't have time for that. But when we get in gear of serving the Lord, there is a joy in it. I'm going to tell you, two weeks of vacation, 10 days, whatever it was, was awesome. But I missed doing what God called me to do, and that's pastoring this church. So we're to run with endurance. Now, there's going to be a lot of things that trip us up. Man, there's a lot of things. There's days that we don't feel like running, and guess what? It's my fault. It's your fault. We, we take our eyes off the Lord, and we slip into sin, and, 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 and we realize that we've got so much luggage. Hey, we, we, we flew on our trip out, and I tell you what, getting all situated with luggage and getting in and on a plane, I mean, it's a cumbersome, and all the checkpoints you have to go through. Sometimes that's how we, we live our Christian lives. We're so weighted down with things that we don't need to be weighted down with, that, that we're not able to run with endurance. So that is what we're to do. Everything that I'm going to say from the rest of this passage stems from the fact that we're to run with endurance. We're to keep running when we physically don't feel like it. We're to keep going when we spiritually don't feel like it. We're to keep going. Now, there's going to be some, some things that in this passage that encourage us to run with endurance. Remember, this is written to a group that is being persecuted. They're, they're fearful, and they're trying to figure out what it means to follow Christ. And, and so they're to run with endurance. Well, the author reminds them here that there's a stadium of witnesses. 
Now, this is very peculiar language in our modern language, but, but look at how the author writes it. It's really a very poetic way of describing a great cloud of people. And, and we're reminded the first part of verse 1 of Hebrews 12, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, who are these witnesses? In the context of Hebrews 12, He's referring back to Hebrews chapter 11. We, we call that the great hall of faith. He's referring back to the men and women that are listed in that heroes of faith and, and how they ran with endurance. They were faithful. And, and we can go back through the Word of God, through Genesis, through the Old Testament, and though this passage is not referring to the New Testament, we could carry that cloud of witnesses on into the New Testament. Man, the Apostle Paul encourages me. A man that was out on the street preaching would be beaten and thrown into jail and the next day out on the street preaching again. That encourages me to run with endurance. I mentioned the passage in James just a moment ago. Man, aren't we surrounded by trials every given day. But yet to know God is working in those trials to grow us in our patience and to help us to be mature. And as James 1 verse 5 reminds us, in the midst of the confusion of a trial, we can ask God for wisdom and he gives it to us. And, and so I think of not only the Old Testament saints, but I think of all of the, the, the apostles. And I think about the early church and how they were so faithful. And then I carry it into my own life. I think of men and women in my home church, Long Creek Baptist Church, and, and I wouldn't be the man of God that I am today if it wasn't for their praying and their faithfulness. And as a new believer, they took me under their wing and they taught me what it meant to pray and to study the Word of God. And I had a pastor that, that loved me and genuinely loved preaching the Word of God. And I think of all the churches that I've pastored. I think of you and how you encourage me. And you've got saints in your life that encourage you. Maybe parents, grandparents, teachers, coaches. That's what the writer is saying here. We can run with endurance in how encouraging it is to go to the Word of God and to read about Abraham. And, and, and him sacrificing or being called to sacrifice his son and how he dealt with that in faith. And, and, and we think of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Man, we think of Moses leading the Israelites out of bondage and how difficult that was. And, and we have the story of Ruth and we learn that, that the Lord is our kinsman redeemer. And it goes all the way through all the stories of the New Testament, even into the stories of, of saints that we know that, that influenced us in our lives. And somehow or another, we look at those and we think, man, that, that great cloud of witnesses, God saved them. He brought them through every trial of life. And many of them did not get all the promises that were promised them this side of eternity. But we'll get them in eternity. And we look at how they were faithful and how God led them and how their lives were productive and how they ran with endurance. And somehow or another, it encourages us to keep going. Man, I think of, of those that have underwent so much persecution and so many trials, and yet God was faithful. And I'm like, God, if you're no respecter of people, if you were faithful in their lives, you're going to be faithful in my life. And it just encourages me to keep going. But you know, there's going to be a struggle. There's going to be a struggle. Sin. You know, we've been saved from the power of sin when we trust Christ. We have. Sin does not have to have power over us anymore. We've been saved from that. One of these days, we're going to be saved from the presence of sin because there's no sin in heaven. And, and, and so that is what the writer is going to remind us of here in the middle. We are going to run with endurance. Yes, there's so many people from the Word of God, from, an, from our own personal lives, from our families, from our church families that encourage us, but there's going to be a struggle. So how do we deal with that struggle? Well, let's look at the middle part of the verse. We begin again. Therefore also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us lay aside every weight. Now, this is a, an athletic expression here. Athletes, as they did in the times of the New Testament, 
with the ancient Olympic Games here all the way up to our current games, whether it be our Olympics or our, our, our everyday, you know, sports arena things. Um, all of the different stuff like that. There, there, there's training. There's a discipline time where you have a, a certain diet and, and there's a certain regimen of, of, of lifting weights and exercising and building those, those muscles up. But you know, when it's game day, when it's time to get out on the field, you're not going to be out there lifting weights. You know, runners would put weights around their ankles to, to build endurance and to strengthen their leg muscles. They're not going to be doing that on game day. First of all, you'd be disqualified. But second of all, that would be foolish. I mean, you would have no hope of running with endurance and crossing the finish line and being victorious with all of that weighting you down. Folks, I see this in my own life. I see this in, in, in life of my church family, sometimes my own family, uh, of things that are not necessarily bad. Now, I realize this is one of those, as the old preachers would say, all right, he has quit preaching and he's gone to meddling. And, and I think you understand what that means. I mean, this is one of those sermons where you come out the door and you say, oh, that was a phrase that stepped on my toes. Well, there was a pastor one time, I think his name was Brother Billy Harris, who said... I wasn't trying to step on your toes. I was aiming for your heart. And by the way, that was a pastor up near the Sweetwater area where I was at. Um, but I, I am aiming for your heart. I, I'm not trying to meddle. But here's what we do as Christians. It's, it's not a question between the good and the bad. We, we know to avoid the bad. We know that bad wrecks our lives. We know that Jesus Christ died to give us victory over sin. We understand that. But, but it's not a question between the good and the bad or the bad and the good. It's a question between the, the better and the best. God wants the best for us. And, and in my own life, sometimes I sacrifice God's best for something that's mediocre. And, and, and how do I put this into words that we can digest it? I mean, anything, are you listening to me? Anything that you're putting before God, it may not be a bad thing. It can be another thing that brings you joy. It doesn't have to be sin. It can be another person. It, it doesn't matter what it is. Anything you're putting before God, it, it, is, it is above God, which ultimately is sin. I mean, because God is to have first place in our hearts. If we're putting anything before God, but in our minds and according to society, it, it may not be considered sin, but anything that you are putting above God, I mean, that is a weight that is weighing you down. It can be fear. It can be doubt. It can be laziness. It can be being so involved in the hoops and, 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 and the jumps of life that we're not paying attention to what is really important. What is really important? Living for Christ being faithful and serving in his church. Why is it so important to be part of a Bible-believing, evangelistic, mission-minded church? Because that's a picture of a, of a New Testament church. That, that's what we're to be. And, and so it's important to get plugged into that so that you can use the talent that God has given you. And as I said earlier, that's where we find joy. So think about that. Pray about that. What is keeping you? It may be a hobby. It may be a passion, and there's nothing wrong with hobbies. I have hobbies. That is what relaxes me and recharges me so that I can continue doing what I'm doing right now. Whatever it is, I mean, and it may be your 9 to 5 job, but think about it. Is Christ where he needs to be in your life? Now, we understand sin. He, he says to, to get rid of the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares you. Have you ever been tangled in briars? I've got a rose bush, and why I did this, sometimes I'm not the sm smartest man. Okay, in my backyard, along my privacy fence, I have one of those, those, those brackets that you mount on the wall of the fence to wrap your, your garden hose around. And so I, I mounted it and put it there, and why I did this, it makes no sense, I planted a rose bush in front of it. Not necessarily, I mean, it's probably four feet from it, and it was a little bitty rose bush, and I still could get to my water hose, which I have to use quite frequently. And over time, it's like a, a, a rambling rose that shoots out appendages six feet long. And so that thing had grown up just everywhere. And so inevitably, I'm like, well, I don't want to prune it. I mean, you know, 
it, it's going to bloom, and the more limbs it's got, the more blooms it'll have. So I'd try to get in there and get my water hose. Why on earth would you plant a rose bush in front of your water hose? I don't know. I'd try to get the water hose out, and I would end up bleeding every time. Finally, I cut that thing back to nothing, and I, I believe before spring it's going to have a new location in the yard. So have you ever been tangled up in a rose bush or a vine? I mean, it just... just Kudzu, I mean, it grows everywhere here. You've seen what it will do to a tree. A magnificent tree that's been there for decades will ultimately be choked and killed by kudzu. It just smothers the life out of everything. Well, that's what the writer here is reminding us. Sin entangles us. It starts out private. Nobody knows about it but God. And remember, he sees everything. He knows. And, and, and it just affects us. But think about it. Sin never affects just one person. If you're living in sin and you have a family, it's affecting your family. It's affecting those that you work with. You come to church and you worship, and remember, we're all sinners. We've either accepted Christ and had forgiveness of sin, or we've rejected Christ and the sin's still on our, on our heads, but it doesn't have to be. We can receive God's free gift of salvation. But, but it affects the assembly of, of believers coming together. Sin just ensnares, and, and it destroys. And, and so the writer here is saying... If you're going to be the Christian God wants you to be and that you're going to stand before one day and give an account of how you lived your life, be encouraged by all these witnesses and get rid of the things in your life that's hindering you from being a Christian. If you can live without them, get rid of them. If you need to keep them, put them in their right place. Don't make them God. And for goodness sake, please confess the sin and get rid of it. Jesus Christ died so that you could have victory over it. The thing that we think is so pleasurable, and my goodness, there's pleasure in sin. I wouldn't be foolish enough to tell you it wasn't. We wouldn't want to do it if it wasn't fun. But man, it's only fun for a brief moment, right? We, 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 we sow a breeze and reap the whirlwind. All right. There is one more phrase in this passage. So... Beware of the cloud of witnesses. Let me just read the verse again. It's the last phrase in verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance. What? I, th this is just exciting to me. I know, maybe it's just a preacher thing. It should be a Christian thing, though. Look at this last phrase. The race that is set before us, don't miss what the author is saying here. The race that is set before us. I say this so often. God is too powerful. I mean, it's nothing he can't do. He's too wise to make a mistake. He's too loving to not be concerned with everything that's going on in our lives. Now, believe in all of that in our heart. He knows everything that is going to happen to us. And I done got tickled at myself. I'm looking around like y'all are here. I, I said it in the sermon this morning. I was going to pretend y'all are here. So ever how they're going to set it up, I hope I'm looking at you. I don't know really where I'm looking because there's no one here now. But I done got so excited at what I'm saying. I'm looking. No, I'm not really seeing y'all here. You think I've done lost my mind. I do miss you, though. Anyway, back, back to, to what we're talking about. Lisa's back there laughing at me. Um... The race has been set before us. Isn't that an awesome thing? The race is set before us. God has already planned it out. So if an all-powerful, all-wise, all-loving God has planned it out, why can't we walk by faith, not by sight? Why can't we just humbly surrender to the will of God and run with endurance? It will go the way we want it to go, Sometimes it may go the way we never anticipated it to go. But we keep going because Jesus didn't stop for us. Have you ever thought about that? We're about to talk about Jesus. Unless I forget the illustration, let me go ahead and say it now because it's going to go into verse 2. What if Jesus had went halfway to the cross? You know, he was abused tremendously before he was ever nailed to the cross. What if he had stopped there? What if, I mean, he could have called legions of angels to rescue him at any moment well, I mean but he didn't he went all the way to death to the grave and was victorious to secure our salvation I don't want to go halfway for the Lord 
He saved me. I had nothing to do with it. He took the initiative. I grew up, I thought about this while we were on vacation and, 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 and looking at the beautiful mountains. And to me, snow is one of the most beautiful things, although I would die having to live in that year round. Y'all heard the funny story about our little cabin that was all electric and over a foot of snow and the trees breaking the power lines down. And it was 12 degrees that night. We all slept in every ounce of clothing that we could find. We had, I had so much cover on me, I thought I was not going to be able to take my next breath. And we all just huddled down. Got up the next morning to my surprise. It's 12 outside. It's 40 in the cabin. And you can see your breath. Lillian's like, I can blow smoke. <laughs> and I'm thinking, we've got to find shelter. We're not, we're, these people from South Alabama is not going to survive this. But, but in, even in all of that beauty of the snow and the mountains and, and God creating all of that, I was just overwhelmed at the goodness of God. And if he did all of that, he has a plan that he has set before us. And he died on the cross for us. And he went all the way. And through faith in him, I am to go all the way with him. Run with endurance. What does he say in the next verse? Looking unto Jesus. Folks, that's our strategy. It's great that we have a cloud of witnesses. It's great that we want to run with endurance. It's great that we conquer and put God first and conquer the sins in our lives. But we're not going to last very long if, if we're not grounded on Jesus. A church that's not grounded on Jesus is not going to last. A life that is not grounded in Jesus is not going to flourish. I mean, we see that in our nation. The reason our nation is floundering the way it is is because we took God out years ago, years before I was even born. But my goodness, in the 50 years that I've been born, we've tried to take him out even more. And we wonder, why is school such a wreck? Why are homes such a wreck? Why are our children so disrespectful to parents? Why is all of this happening? And we wring our hands and we're like, we need more counselors and we need more programs and we need more assistance. Well, not that any of those things are bad. We need more Jesus. I don't know why people can't understand this other than it being the devil has just blinded. I mean, look at it at, at all. Take it all the way back to Rome. Man, you could take it all the way back to the, to the Old Testament. You look at these kingdoms that rose and they fall. Those that took their eyes off of the Lord floundered and fell. Why do we think we'll be any different as Americans? Praise the Lord, we have freedom of religion. But you know, not every religion can be right. God is God and his word is his word and it's truth. We need to be serious about proclaiming that. Well, we get into the next verse. If we're going to run with endurance, it's great we have the cloud of witnesses. It's great that we have the determination to stay on track that he set before us. But here's the strategy. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, I've used this illustration of my wedding every time I ever preach this, and you will recall it before I ever say it, because we look at this every January. But looking into Jesus, you know, we go to the store and we look around. Although the older I get, the more I do not enjoy that. But, um, you know, you, you go and you, we, we call it window shopping or, 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 I don't know, maybe dreaming about things we want and we, we can't afford to buy. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. But looking around, you know, right now I'm looking around the congregation. That's not really what the word means here. Looking into Jesus in the original language here actually means to take your eyes off of everything and you have found the one thing that thrills your soul and you're not going to take your eyes off of it. It doesn't matter what's going on over here. It doesn't matter what's going on over there. And, and I use my wedding as an illustration because for most men, um, weddings are very nerve-wracking. Of course, I've preached a million of them since I got married myself. But after 20 years of, of marriage and thinking back to that glorious day, of course, the, the groom is standing up there with the groomsman and Usually these are guys that you don't really know what, what are going to do. And, you know, I, I think I've shared the story of our twin ring bearers, um, two little twin boys, um, Josh and David. Um, they didn't actually have the ring, thank the Lord, or, or we, we wouldn't have rings today. But um, they had pillows just to, to be symbolic that they had the ring. And 
I, I'm up there, and but before I get to the funny story, let's talk about looking into Jesus. So you're, you're all standing up there, and then the wedding march begins to play, and the double doors of the church open, and there comes my bride. Now, I rode to church with Lisa the day of our wedding, but we had kind of wanted to be traditional, and so I did not see her in her gown until she came down the aisle. And so, of course, you're already nervous because you're a man and you're about to get married and you're like, dear Lord, I'm going to be responsible for another person and I can't even take care of myself. So all that's going through your mind and the double doors fly open and there's my father-in-law who during the rehearsal when you say, who gives this bride to be married, he would not say my mother and I. I mean, he just wouldn't say it. He's just like, we don't do it. So I'm just like, I hope that's a joke. What are you really going to say in the wedding? So there they come down the aisle looking unto Jesus. Here, here's the mental image in my mind. It didn't matter that my family was there. It didn't matter that the groomsmen were there. It didn't matter that the ring bearer twin boys were there fighting with the pillow. It didn't matter what was going on. It didn't matter that my scary father-in-law was there. My eyes were on Lisa. I mean, it wouldn't matter if the roof had fell in. I, I, I was like, there's the most beautiful, wonderful lady I have ever met in my life. And I should get a pork chop dinner for that tonight. Although I really mean it. But that's what the author is saying here. If we're going to run with endurance, I almost forgot the funny story of the ring bearers. All right, we have our back to the congregation, right? We're being married. The pastor's facing the audience. I can hear a commotion back on the steps. And it's so funny, in the video, you can see me doing this, like I'm trying to kill the ring bearer boys. And I don't I think one of them fell down the steps. Um, but anyway, all of that aside, looking unto Jesus. He is the one that thrills our soul. He is the one that gives us the, 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 the ability to live the Christian life. He's the one that will never leave and forsake us. He's the one that we're going to see one day all through eternity. Man, the, the, the only evidence of sin and glory, because there's no sin in heaven, will, will be the scars on his hands, and it will remind us of the great love that God had and just what it cost Jesus to die for us so that we can be in glory. So if we're going to run with endurance, praise the Lord. I can read about Abraham and Moses and Paul and, 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 and Brother Jim Meadows, my home pastor, and my my, my family and others that are here that I look up to so much, man, that encourages me to run with endurance that I want to get rid of all the things in my life that are hindering my walk. And I don't want to have sin in my life, but the thing that is going to keep me doing it through cancer and through all that's going on in my life is that I'm not going to take my eyes off of Jesus, or at least that's my prayer, and that's my prayer for you. Looking into Jesus, who is he? He's the author and finisher of our faith author the pioneer the imagery here and we know he's the author and finisher in the fact that he left the glories of heaven and, 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 and secured everything on Calvary's cross and in his resurrection that it took to to satisfy the wrath of God against sin I mean he was the ultimate perfect sacrifice we understand that but the imagery here is that the Lord is always a pace before us remember from the end of verse 1 the race that is set before us the Lord is always a pace before us and sometimes sometimes some glorious times, like where is it? Matthew 11, 28 through 30, where, where we're yoked with Christ. Every tear that we shed, the Lord is yoked with us and he's shedding the tears. Every day that we feel like stumbling, he's there to, 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 to lift us back up. And man, many of the days of our lives, he's carrying us. He's the one giving us the strength to keep going. That's why we're able to run with endurance. He's been down the road. No one ever. And I think about the martyrs that were burned at the stake. I think about those that were beheaded. Our own apostles, the disciples that we read about. Man, they endured such hostility. I think about people today in other parts of the world that are, are Christians underground because their lives are at stake. And I think about all those who are suffering. No one ever suffered like Christ. Not only physically, but he who had known knew no sin we've always known sin because we were born as sinners but but he never knew sin yes it was terrible to to be crucified it was terrible to, to have all those horrible physical things that happened but to take my sins your sins the sins of the world and have them placed on him to never have known sin oh my how terrible that was for him 
But look at what the Scripture says. Why did he do it? Well, we're looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Here, here the phrase is, man, this passage is so filled with truth. It's so filled with goodness. It's why it's one of my favorite scriptures. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. For the joy that was set before him. Was the joy being beaten? <laughs> no. Was the joy having his beard plucked? No. Was the joy having the crown of thorns thrust on his head? No. And I read something recently, and, and it pains my soul to even think of it, but it just shows the love of the Lord for, for lost sinners. We always see Jesus hanging on the cross, and he has like a linen apron. Most people were crucified naked, so it's quite possible he was. He endured all of that shame and, and, and the pain of being crucified. And folks, you know this. You, you're a mature group. I mean, the, 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 the most painful part was the enduring of it for, for sometimes for days out in the elements. I mean, that, that, it's, it's the most cruel and horrible thing that, that man has ever devised. And, and yet he endured all that for what? What was the joy? It wasn't for the agony. It, it wasn't for saying, I get to do something that... I mean, others were crucified, but he was God and to take on the sins of the world. What was the joy? You and I. You and I. To present us spotless before the Lord. Isn't that amazing? The love that God has for us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We, we, didn't, we, we didn't take the initiative in it. God did. The joy that was before him endured the cross, despising the shame. But it doesn't end there. He didn't stay in that grave, did he? Oh, no. And is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know... For many of us, I never was real big in sports, so that's not the analogy that sticks with me, but since there is the imagery here of running with endurance, and the writer uses that kind of to, to talk about our Christian walk, but if you've ever participated in sports, I mean, it cheers you on to have the crowd chanting, and to be able to look up in the stadium and to see a loved one there that is near and dear to your heart and to know they are there because of you, that they're there to cheer you on, that they believe in you and they love you, that just motivates you to keep going. And, and, and for me, you know, I always love to have my family in church when, when, when I'm preaching, um, especially extended family that are not here, such as my you know, wife and daughter. But, but to know someone believes in you and they care for you and they're supporting you, it, it, it just does something for you. Well, think about the Lord. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he's victorious. He's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And I picture him cheering us on. I mean, he's saying, run with endurance. I died for you. I rose for you. I'm going to give you everything you need to run this race with endurance. There's going to be times it is going to be very difficult. There's going to be times when you're not going to be on your feet. You're going to be on your knees. But that is okay. You are my child. I died for you. I am waiting for you in glory. When you take your last breath, I will be the sight here that you see. Doesn't that encourage you to keep going? It's worth it. Millions don't know that yet. Others are floundering. They're Christians, but they're living in such a way that you look at their lives and you're like, man, is their faith real? How can they live in such a way? If we're looking into Jesus, we won't live in that way. Our heart's desire will be to run with endurance. And then verse 3 just sums up what the author is reminding these persecuted Christians and what we're reminded of today. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Consider him. Let your thought be Christ. Run with endurance. The race that God has mapped out, he knows the day of your physical birth, 
He knew the day of your salvation, and He knows the day that our heart will take its last beat and we step off into eternity. He knows those that have received Him. He knows those that have rejected Him. And He's saying, keep living your faith. Whether you feel like it or not, keep going. Think of all the people in the Word of God and throughout your life that has finished the race. I never left them and I never forsook them. As you're running, get rid of the things that are hindering you. Confess the sin and let me forgive it and forget it and restore you. Keep your eyes on Christ. I'm the author and finisher of your faith. For the joy that was set before me, I, just, I, I endured the shame. I'm now at the right hand of the throne of God. Keep running faithfully. Church, that's the challenge for each of us. It's a brand new year. A brand new year. It's hard to believe. 16 days into that new year. How are we running the race? It's not too late to receive Christ. If the Holy Spirit is pricking your heart, just say yes to Jesus. It's certainly not too late, even if we've got a whole plethora of mistakes, to surrender to God tonight and to begin to run this race the way God saved us to run it. The decision is ours. We, well, He will not force us. I'm going to close with a word of prayer. I covet your prayers for us as we travel this week. I said this at the close of the last sermon that I was here with you physically. Don't assume that I'm not here to serve you. He's, you know, I can't bother him. He's got a lot going on. I am your pastor. So if you need me, call me. We're going to pray and get through this together. Amen. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for this passage, Lord. Lord, if we looked at it once a month, it wouldn't be enough to keep us motivated to live the way that we wish, that, that we are going to wish that we had lived when we stood before you. Lord, let us not waste a single precious moment, Lord. We love you. I pray for each person here. If someone needs salvation tonight, Lord, let them say yes to Jesus. If somebody just needs to rededicate and, and run with endurance, let them do that as well. We love you and ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.